But today what we're going to focus on is, is kind of an interactive session where we're going to talk a bit about WVD uh, and really kind of how you start driving adoption of WVD in earnest for the right applications and the right users in your environment. Um, today with me, we have a couple of really special guests. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Samit Halvadia, Chief Technology Officer here at Remo3. Uh, my entire two decades of professional service has really been focused around enterprise application management, um, ranging from install shield to app DNA to Citrix and ultimately here at Remo3. Um, quickly alongside me, I'll let Mike Broadwood introduce himself. Mike? Thank you so much, Samit. Uh, Mike Broadwood here, uh, Technical Alliance Director for Lakeside. Um, one of my key responsibilities is working with um, the best of breed, really. Uh, so the Remos and the, the Microsofts as well to bring kind of um, products to market. Uh, and uh, thrilled to partner with you guys, really, to help simplify the journey, to help smooth the way to getting uh, desktops on Azure. So I'm excited about today. Thank you so much for, for hosting and having me. Appreciate it, Mike. Glad you could make it. And uh, I think everyone knows John. John? Sure. Uh, John Jenner from Microsoft, one of the WVD specialists for uh, GVB, Global Black Belt, if you will, for the acronyms. Uh, I've <laughs> been involved with Remo3 and Lakeside for quite some time. And I have my great friend and colleague here, Stefan, also on the call. Um, Stefan, you need no further introduction to everybody but you. Yeah, 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 that's it. Hi, everyone. My name is Stefan. I'm a PM on the Remote Desktop Services team. And um, yeah, that's about it. See, Stefan was our big ace in the hole. Like, we didn't want to publicize it, but like, if you showed up, you get to talk to Stefan today, which is a big deal. So thank you for joining on short notice, Stefan. Really appreciate it. So today what I thought we'd do is, you know, the agenda is going to be pretty straightforward. I think first what we'd love to hear is, you know, you've seen a lot of this. I mean, if you're here, you're obviously interested in WPP, started your adoption, you're some point on your journey. Uh, what I wanted to kind of uh, lead off with is a introduction from uh, Stefan. Kind of, you saw a lot of great announcements around MSIX and App Attach last week and some of the new releases and features around WVD in general. So um, what we thought we'd lead off with is a bit of a product update from Stefan himself, um, where we can start understanding a bit more about things that have been announced, what that really means, and then hand it off to John to talk about, you know, with these new updates, with these new features, what does it mean from the field? What's the view from the field? And as we kind of start getting into that, we'll start getting some additional feedback from the team. So feel free to engage and chat at any point through the chat. And then ultimately, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how between Lakeside and Remo3, we can help you drive decisions with data around which workloads, which applications, which users to move to set you up for the highest probability of success or set your customers up with the highest probability of success. So, Stefan, um, are you good for me to hand it off to you if you have a slide uh, to show? Yeah, let's try it. All right, you want to grab it for me? As usual, teams decide to share their own screen, but let me know when you can see it. There we can see it. Yeah, okay. So, I used to be asked this question about you last week. Uh, is MSX GA? And it had a really long and convoluted story, starting with uh, back in 2018, late 2018, early 2019, when uh, MSIX format itself was announced as a GA. Uh, that was at a build conference. And what does that mean? That means that if you are a developer or an ISV, you can go read the documentation, update your application to follow the standards, the MSX standard, and then you can publish it as a .MSX package that your customers can download. And that's where it pretty much stopped, you know, as developer adopting it. Uh, later that year, uh, me and Randy Cook uh, kind of started thinking about what can we do for WVD. And in March of 2019, we started working internally on MSX App Attach. Back then, that was just supposed to be the uh, the working title, and it stick 
and it, that's the name of the feature these days. Um, but in uh, 20, 20 April, when Windows 10 2004 came out, MSX Apatash, which was what we've been working on since uh, 2019, came GA. And people are like, what does that mean? So that means that if you are using Windows 10 2004 or up, you have access to the APIs that allow you to do MSX Apatash, which is great, right? And then what do you do with those APIs? Not much, <laughs> honestly, unless you are a developer or somebody that likes to spend a lot of time in PowerShell. There was no there was no management UI for MSX after that. Um, it, it, I like to compare it to a lot of other features. Like we have a geolocation APIs in Windows. If there is no Internet Explorer to send your location to your favorite tracking website, who cares that there are uh, geolocation APIs in Windows? And what we announced last week was the the management UI for MSX Apatach, but in WD. Okay, so if you go into the Azure portal and you go to your host pool, there will be a tab called MSX Packages and you'll be able to manage uh, the assignments of the packages to your users. So that was the announcement uh, yes, uh, last week. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, you can... You, MSX Apatach in WD is GA, MSX Apatach is GA, MSX is GA. And then the next question is, well, well how do I use it outside of WD? And the answer is, well, here, is, here are the APIs, here is PowerShell, or you go to a partner and leverage their solution to manage MSX Apatach on premises. Um, and that's really it for um, MSX Apatach as announcement last week. Some resources on the screen if you want to learn more about MSX Apatach and how to use it, how to get started. And with that said, uh, I will see if there are any questions. Let's see I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't see any questions either. I want to make sure chat is enabled. Sila and Eddie, is, is chat enabled? Is, can anyone type in? Yes. This there we go. I see it. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah if at any point there are any questions, uh, we will be monitoring the chat. So feel free if, uh, if lightning strikes uh, as we go through this to to pop right in. Perfect. Um, anything else from your side, Stefan, before we hand off to John? Um, I mean, not at the moment. I mean, I, I can talk for hours on MSX Apatach. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know you let's can. Let's give to a five minute recap on what MSX Apatach was, is, and where are we going? Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Perfect, John. Um, so, you know, with Stefan, the, the update around what MSIX Apatach, the announcements around WVD and what it means, um, I think this is a perfect kind of segue into John talking a little bit more about, well, it's great, you know, we've got a, we've got a great piece of technology. Why are people see, choosing WVD or exploring WVD and what are some of the challenges that they've had in the field? Um, so John, I'll turn it over to you to kind of talk a little bit more about uh, about the perspective from the field. Uh, absolutely. Um, if you could just fast forward that one slide, not this one, the next one. You got it. Yeah, that one, perfect. All right, so <clears throat> for the last, we're gonna call it two years, um, my team, obviously Stefan's team, and most of our field sellers and customers have been focusing on WVD for these specific workloads that you see here. Now, on the left side, you're gonna have the compelling events, and on the right side comes out of use cases. So on a compelling event, like a data center hardware refresh, you'll actually establish use cases out of that event that's coming that you will then map to how Windows Virtual Desktop would fulfill that use case, right? So. The, again, the last year, which has been the pandemic and COVID, we had a, a huge impact on work from home scenarios, right? The work from home scenarios were just that. It is, let me get my end user 
a desktop to still function and do their day-to-day -day activities. We did not really focus on the application of state at all at that time. Now that we've come full circle, the pandemic is, you know, hopefully going to be behind us within the next couple months. Um, we need to start looking at the application state, which is often not looked at initially because we were trying to solve for a work from home scenario, right? Or a developer's workstation scenario. Those two are basically the same in, in itself. They basically publish a desktop to your end users, right? Now, fast forward, we're in a much more mature state. Um, we've just released MSIX. So now we have to start to think about the application conversation. And when we go to look at WVD now as a product and implementation, the application conversation has to be part of that. It's no longer just, okay, what is my compelling event? Your compelling events are always going to be there, right? But how do I now ev evangelize the application estate? Because that is often left behind when you have your data and your application sitting either on-prem or in another cloud provider, or even in Azure for that matter, right? The two things when the application conversation comes up. One, we got to figure out the conversion of the applications, right? If they're in legacy format, now is the time to have the conversation of, okay, can I lift and shift them, or can I migrate them, or basically refactor and rehost them? And how do I actually have that conversation? Um, and then the second piece is, where does the data reside once I figure out part one of the application story? Right, data is going to be the most complex but essential thing to deal with now as we move on with the product and, and become much more mature in the virtualization space. Uh, again, we've only done desktops for the most part. We did some remote published applications, but the end game here, call center customers that have an application that's running in their call centers right across the world, figure that one out banking applications, right? Stuff like that, that touches a lot of the end users as well as public people, that now needs to be taken into account because you actually wanna bring that also into a virtualized space for obvious reasons, elasticity, redundancy, right? And obviously uh, uptime. Now, taking into that account, um, Samit, if you go to the next slide, we now have the common Windows virtual use cases. So if you look here, some of them you have an EMR, right? Healthcare EMR, um, emergency management records, a good case now to have that application conversation, right? How can I then publish an EMR application across my entire hospital healthcare system to then, and also move the data across, right? Government, David Sovereignty. The next one is call centers and mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions is probably the biggest one that comes to light because as a companies acquire other companies, they all have different application estates to contend with, right? How do we then control and fold up those applications into a centralized repository with the data to basically make it much more elastic, right? And cohesive across. These are the pieces of the model that we're gonna discuss and start to today with Remotery and with Lakeside to start having that roadmap on basically helping people empower them to have those conversations, right? With the awesome tool sets that they bring to the table. With that said, I can hand it over to you, Samit, if you want, or Mike. Sure, I think I think from our perspective, right? If you look at- um, Yes, four pillars. Yeah, yeah. really quickly, the, the four pillars that, that we're talking about, um, you know, it, it's interesting because when you start thinking about the engagement, you know, there, there's a difference between, uh, you know, John and I have talked about this, this is Mike, right? There's a difference between, you know, kicking the tires and then there's difference between actually trying a proof of concept in earnest. And uh, some of the challenges kind of associated with that is, you know, the mo a lot of the POCs that I've seen that John's kind of brought me into is very much, hey, listen, I've deployed uh, WVD as a desktop for just these 15 to 50 users and we have office 365 maybe teams like one or two to three applications sitting into that environment and and really there's a there's a whole what's next right we're, we're doing this for a couple of weeks we're doing this for a couple of months 
but who are the next set of users that need to move on to this? How do I set myself up for success by choosing the right applications to enable a great user experience so that ultimately we can start tiering a rollout that makes sense, right? So from an assessment perspective, one of the things that we're gonna talk about is the theme of deciding with data, starting with Lakeside and then moving on to us at Remo3, where they're gonna focus on prioritization and understanding of what the existing environment looks like from a user and application perspective, and then us really driving a lot of automation around the testing and performance around whether or not an application can work in your desired WVD environment. And it's only once you get this data around the assessment that you can start doing an implementation that's based off of a roadmap focused on data. So if we tell you these 80% of your applications are going to work out of the box, then these 50% of your applications and user base will actually be able to take advantage of MSIX and ultimately App Attach, and then these 20% are actually multi-session friendly. What you've started doing is actually creating that roadmap of this is how I can drive an implementation off of the data around our assessment, right? It's not just about having the data, it's about having actionable data that you can start executing a plan against so that ultimately you get to the point where you've deployed successfully and then started operationally with Lakeside optimizing what that uh, what the deployment looks like. With Remo, assessing and automating change management and understanding the impact of a new feature release, of understanding a new cumulative update into your WVD environment. What happens when you add a new application? So for us, what you're gonna see kind of today when we talk about deciding with data, it's not just about the assessment for the migration, but it's about enabling the entire migration, ultimately post-deployment, driving some value for the customer base, for the partner base to say, you know what? There is going to be constant change, but what is the impact of change before I push deploy? And the catalyst to all this was the great work that Stefan has been working on for the last year to actually make this happen, right? The GA release, so now everything is done inside the same blade for WBD. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's hats off to Stefan because that was a huge release, so. Fantastic. Any questions around that before we hand it off to uh, to Mr. Broadwood? Okay, I assume someone's monitoring the chat as I'm in full screen. So, off to you, Mike. Fantastic. Well, absolutely. So we've we mentioned this a couple of times about using data for decisions, and that's critical here. So we've been um, um, here, like so we've been partners with Microsoft for 20 years, um, and we've we've worked hand in hand on a lot of initiatives. Now WVD was was a little bit different um, because whenever you've initially looked at a desktop transformation project or for an organization looking to put kind of a, a multi-user environment, the conversation was always about kind of density, I suppose, like how many users can I fit on this particular piece of tin um, with the relevant technology behind it, etc. So organizations, when they started going down the road of um, kind of a desktop transformation project, they would often just pick a department. Like, for instance, they'll say, let's go for our engineering department and then just throw them into this new environment and then see how it goes. Now, that's not the best plan kind of initially because there are so many different variables that you need to consider. For instance, the applications might be just terrible initially uh, for this type of uh, type of engagement and the users as well. Um, so that's kind of how we've kind of always done things kind of historically. But the more and more kind of projects that are, we were starting to get engaged with, the conversation got changed. The conversations weren't necessarily, you know, how many users can I fit on this? It was more about how much is it going to kind of cost me like how many users can fit into in this bracket um so that's kind of where we started working so for those who don't know lakeside um is the the technology uh, is the company and sistrack is the solution and we specialize in digital employee experience so we monitor how individuals utilize resources today and kind of quantify the health of those environments so we understand exactly the users, you know, productivity, if they're having constraints, um, their experience, the, the work. So the key bit here and how we were working together was let's identify 
individuals that have a similar resource footprint, a similar work pattern, workflow. So regardless of kind of what department they're in, this is kind of like an ideal use case. The use case is now individuals that share a similar footprint. So what we've got here, we decided to pick um, CPU, memory and time, because time obviously is very important as well. So if you're looking to move people over to, uh, to WED, you don't necessarily want to have individuals that have, you know, 300 hours a month of kind of active time because that you know, might not necessarily be a good fit. So what we're able to do here is understand how they use it so we can kind of um, choose the ideal candidates. So we can just kind of progress a little bit along on the slide. Um, and then one more. So the great thing here now is that we can actually do that. And we pull down, we integrate with Azure Migrate. So not only do we understand how people are utilizing resources today, we can also identify um, or marry that data with Azure resource sizing. So we can start, before you start going into a long proof of concept and kicking tires, et cetera, you can kind of, you can start the ball rolling on a stronger footing because you know, okay, based on the criteria that we've selected and based on this choice of resource what does it look like how many users if we're going to utilize a multi-user environment multi-user windows 10 vm how many users can we fit on this like what does it look like if we're wanting to do a single session you know how many of these chosen users would be able to fit with this particular model and then of course along that we can talk about kind of um, expenses as well just kind of on an economics front now not only are we identifying kind of the users the benchmarking the health of the environment because if you're looking to implement a new technology you want to make sure they're having a good experience as well so to actually benchmark the health so that you can meet or beat those expectations is key but what we also do is say okay so these x amount of users that fit this criteria what are the most critical applications that they use on a day-to-day -day basis so not just all the applications that are installed not just that we have thousands of applications that these people have installed what will show you based on focus time which applications are important for them to do their job to be productive so that gives us focus not only have we avoided a long expensive just guesstimation project or just picking a department or a use case just because it sounds good we're actually utilizing real data to make this decision so we've identified a group of users and we've identified the applications that are required to do their job so now it's about taking that information and working with it and understanding if those applications are compatible so sam over to you or and i suppose questions as well Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think the questions will pop up as we kind of go through. And, you know, to, to, to Mike's point, right, once you understand the focus time of those applications, you understand the, 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 the concurrent utilization around those applications, and you understand just it, it gives you kind of that baseline of which applications are fundamentally critical to your business. You'll have your tier one applications, your top 10 percent always identified. But the reality is, what about the rest? And for us, what we like to do is we like to take that insight from Lakeside and start thinking about which applications are good candidates to move. So once we have the data around which users are best candidates to move, which applications are the best candidates to move based off of priority and utilization, then we become the technical platform to drive the automation basically around application testing. And if I had to put us into a single category of what we do for a living, we pioneer automated testing o over time by taking some of the inputs from the likes of Lakeside we, and, and the likes of Azure Resource Manager, uh, Citrix Analytics, and some of these other tools. We would love to be able to start doing some modeling and some groupings that'll help you start optimizing what your deployments look like. But from our perspective, we want to answer a couple of questions for you. OK, we understand that this application is important to you, and I know that you want to move it to WVD. Let us do the automated testing to make sure that A, it's a good candidate, so it's compatible, meaning it installs, it's functional, meaning that it works, and it's performant, 
meaning that it works well, right? So by actually mm -hmm. automating the testing around those components, we're going to give you the data to say, this is a good candidate to move to WVD. But WVD has two additional cornerstone features that drive, um, you know, that will, in my opinion, drive the adoption of WVD at a scale that's never been before seen by DAS or VDI in general, right? And one of them is obviously with stuff on here, MSIX and App Attach. Um, but in order to get to App Attach, you obviously have to make the journey to MSIX. And for us, we want to help you determine whether or not an application is also a good candidate for MSIX. And if it is, let's help you convert it. Let's help you create a deployment ready MSIX. And the second bit, right, is, is the multi-session capability, being able to take an application that you're currently deploying in a single instance and determine whether or not it's something that you can deploy and take advantage of multi-session in you know, Windows Enterprise 10 2004 and see if you have multiple usage scenarios, user sessions running on the same VM, that's exciting. Now you're talking about a great user experience, you're talking about modernizing your application, and you're talking about ultimately compressing cost, right? And uh, I shouldn't say compressing cost because that's not always a use case, but optimizing cost, whether it's focusing on a great user experience or it's focusing on cost reduction. So from our perspective, the automated testing journey is around taking the inputs from Config Manager and Lakeside and saying, OK, these are the apps you want to move. Let's tell you what are the most ideal candidates to do. So what I thought I'd do quickly is go into a demonstration, which may or may not have timed out. Pull it up. And here we should be able to see Remo 3 Cloud. Again, what we've, what we've created here is a platform that is driven off of automated testing that is completely unattended. So our entire kind of premise of our value proposition is, I don't know what your app does. Just because it's ie.exe or ie.msi doesn't mean that I know it's Internet Explorer or it's a browser. It doesn't rely on scripting, right? What we know is that we want to test an application that's a silent executable and then figure out whether or not it'll actually function. And for us, it's a pretty straightforward concept that we've done to actually onboard these applications into your environment. Because from a Remo 3 Cloud perspective, and this is one of the things that we're going to talk about because this is one of the, you know, we're giving away two of these assessments uh, at the end of this call for 10 apps each. But we're just going to simply help you understand what would you like to do today? Do you want to actually check out application suitability for WVV, figure out which ones are compatible? on 2004, which ones are compatible on the latest version of WVD, which ones can actually, uh, which ones are multi-session friendly, which ones are MSIX ready, and if they are MSIX ready, can you go ahead and convert them for me? Being able to take those MSIX ready applications and apply our conversion technology, which is based off of the uh, CLI um, tooling that comes out of uh, the MSIX team, but adds our own secret sauce around the front end and automated remediation on the back end to drive a much higher success rate around conversion itself so that ultimately you can take advantage of Intune or App Attach. And then ultimately, once you've deployed those applications, we talked about the change management bit, which is if I'm taking on a new feature release of Windows, if I'm changing my WVD environment by in, uh, in, uh, introducing new applications, if I need to roll out a cumulative update or a security update, what's the impact of that change going to be? And because everything is unattended and because everything is completely automated, we try to make this a completely straightforward process where you just kind of call out, where am I moving from? Do you know three? Where am I moving to? 2004 multi-session, upload my applications, and off I go. So at this point, what you'll get is an email saying, Thank you for uploading your applications. We're building out your baseline uh, images and we're going to build out your target images. We'll send you an email when you're ready to look at your dashboard and ultimately it'll take a you know 20 minutes an application to run through the entire pipeline here. Which is unbelievable. 20 minutes an application. The amount of times I've spoken to customers and they spend months testing application compatibilities. So I just wanted to stress on that because that is <laughs> And, and the whole key here really is, and kind of the process is, is kind of data to make these data-driven decisions. 
like identifying the users, identifying the applications, and then seeing if those applications work as seamlessly as possible. And that's kind of the idea, right? So once we get the data here, that's that's exactly the type of dashboard I want to see. I want to yeah. come in here when I log in and get my suitability dashboard. So that th this was about two hours. Over the course of two hours, I ran through nine applications, uploaded them, right? And and this is the difference, right? If if those of you that are familiar with application compatibility testing, you have a couple of different approaches to it. Back in the day, but when we were app DNA, static analysis was great when you were moving from Windows XP 32 bit to Windows 7 64 bit. It was a linear migration. There's no such thing as a linear migration. Every enterprise will have an application being delivered via Citrix sitting on server 2012 with Zen App 65, mm -hmm. or they'll have something sitting up on Azure server 2019 uh, that they're trying to run and manage through Citrix Cloud, or it'll be something that's being deployed to WVD or a local installation. There's a variety of permutations associated with application deployments and delivery. So what we're trying to do is say, can I answer the question of whether your application will work in your desired environment? So I come in here and I'll show you exactly what type of tests we run through. But when we go come through and actually execute an application, what you're going to see is I'm answering three questions. Can I move it again? This is the data that I'm looking for. Can I move it from its existing environment of 1903 locally installed to WVD as it stands today? And what we'll do is we'll actually go through, restore the machine, and silently install the application, smoke test the application where we're able to grab the screenshots of whether or not something actually worked, see that it launched, go through basically the click. So the intelligent smoke test is an interesting thing because it's not necessarily just about the launch and load. It doesn't, because it doesn't know anything about the app, because it doesn't, it hasn't been scripted as traditional RPA or surface automation. What it does is it launches the parent process and then it says, okay, What's the next click so that I can launch? What's the most likely next click so that I can launch a child process? And ultimately, it launches children processes over the course of the next minute to three minutes. So you actually get a pretty good understanding for 90% of your applications that you can deploy them with confidence because it gives you a binary pass or fail. And then during that time, it'll actually capture the metrics in your environment. Obviously, this is not anything near what Lakeside provides. This is not for sizing. This is not for VDI planning. This is basically saying, is my performance going to be better in my new desired environment or materially worse? So it's and still just give you the information you need here to start deploying with confidence. Yeah, and the experience side of things, again, is so important. That's often one of those things that gets forgotten when these things kind of start getting planned. You need to ensure that the experience is right because often projects fail or at least don't get the rollout that it deserves is because kind of the user acceptance piece hasn't really been taken into consideration. No. It's about benchmarking application performance that we're showing here or the user experience as a whole, because otherwise, you know, you hand a user a new device, a new technology, that like any kind of perceived performance degradation is, is going to be met with uproar. We're yeah. going to start complaining about it. It's just not going to get there. So being proactive about this stuff is very important. Yeah, you that's wanna... a good point. Sorry, Sorry Mike. No, that's, that, that's a great point because, again, the adoption is going to be driven by exactly what Mike is saying, which is perceived user experience. Between their real-life deployment data versus our pre-deployment data, you can get a really good sense of, well, you know, back in 1903, when they ran it for 90 days, this their focus time was 84% on this application and their user experience was, you know, 22 megs of utilization on average. And now we're doubling it. Oh, that's not going to go well. Mm -hmm. So what we've what we've been working with as well is some uh, kind of um, proactive um, sensors and automations. So what you can actually do is if suddenly um, they're utilizing WVD to access applications and um, they're getting bad latency, for instance. So instead of the user saying, oh, this new environment's terrible, I hate it. Hmm. Often what's the case is they've moved somewhere, they've changed rooms and their Wi-Fi is so much worse. 
So to be able to actually determine, okay, the degradation in experience is based on this data set, which is kind of the Wi-Fi, for instance, you can have a little pop-up which basically says, did you change rooms? Please move closer to your router. <laughs> so again, that, as you mentioned before, that perceived performance issues, it's a great way to navigate blame to, um, or point fingers at something which is actually the cause of it, not the perceived performance, which is new technology, I hate change. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it goes root cause, right? It's actionable feedback from, from the side there. Absolutely. Now, I mean, again, this is the data bit, right? Once you've actually made the determination, I could actually deploy all these applications into a single session WVD if I wanted to right now. And I feel confident that in that 2004 enterprise instance, the app's going to work just fine. So already we've solved the first problem, which is which apps do I move first? Now, the second is like, okay, let, let's take that next step of the journey Give me more data. Tell me which ones I can put together so that they can work in a multi-session instance as opposed to those that don't. And what you're able to see right here off the bat is, you know what? You can still do quite a bit of cost compression if you were to roll out, you know, seven of these applications together in that 2004 instance, they do work in a multi-session environment. However, if you look at other ones that do work in single session, these two might have to be deployed separately. Because if I come in and look at what we do with the multi-session, it's the same thing. Again, the intelligent smoke test is our crown jewel in terms of the technology that's driving um, our ability to test at scale. So if I come in, we follow the exact same steps. We install the application, but then what we do is we actually run the application, we install it on a single VM, and then run multiple user sessions. And you can go up to 50, however many sessions you want to run against. But ultimately, what we'll be able to tell you is whether or not that application is going to behave well when multiple user sessions are, are running it. Is it writing to the same file location and causing an issue? Is the second one executable not actually even being launched in the first place? And what you're able to start seeing right here is start actually taking out the ones that are not multi-session friendly and creating a slightly different application delivery strategy around those, whereas the ones that are multi-session friendly can be grouped and start being part of your tier one deployment team. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, Sumit, um, Connor actually posed a pretty good question in the chat, right? Um, what's the best way to represent the data for analysis, right? So like an exporting feature, I guess, so if they put in a list of apps, let's say 12, right? You run, mm -hmm. run the analysis across them, is a way they can maybe export that out to have a compiled list that they could then present, right, to their yeah. leadership to say, okay, here's the issues across these applications, here's what we need to do, here's the ones that do work, here's the ones that perform really well, right? Yeah. So that's a great question. And uh, Connor, I appreciate you teeing that up, right? We do have the ability to take the um, application for uh, report that you're seeing in front of you and export that to Excel. So you can pull that out, run with it. But we also have an API for those people that want to get into the nitty gritty and start grouping applications based on the reason that they fail so that you can start taking automated remediation steps. You do have the ability to export the performance data, the multi-session data, all the test result data um, on the back of our API so that you can start creating very complex models around how to best deploy these applications. So we give you the really simple way of doing it with an export to Excel, and then we give you the flexibility if you're a more mature organization to kind of jam in here and start figuring out how to manipulate the data in a way that's important to you. So if you care about remediating non-multi-session friendly applications, here, here's your group of those. These ones fail because they're trying to write to the same file location. These ones fail because they can't uninstall cleanly. These ones fail because you can't just launch two, execute, two, two user sessions of the same executable. You can start grouping and manipulating. And then what you can do with that data is the applications, for instance, that fail, you can go back to SysTrack and exclude, you can create a group of users that don't use those applications. So you can run that same analysis of resource footprint without these unfriendly applications to really determine, okay, these are my list of users. These are the applications that work. Let's go. Yeah. And I mean, that that's the thing, right? So now you've, you've already taken the first two steps of that journey. The first ones are, which ones can I deploy? Which ones are actually multi-session friendly? And then ultimately we wanna to get to the MSIX bit where we can come in to modernize 
and take a look at, you know, which percent of the applications that we have in our portfolio can be converted. And if they can, have at it, right? So we converted 100% of these nine applications in the environment, but the conversion's not enough, right? The conversion is just the first step. A lot of stuff can be converted. So if I come into something like um, CapCalc here, right? This is a new one, even for Stefan. I come in here and I look at the process we go through from a conversion perspective. We come through and we restore the machine. Again, the intelligent smoke test is what allows us to do this completely unautomated. But we come through and we see, all right, uh, we're, we've got this particular MSI. We're going to stop the window of services. We're going to create the initial conversion, start the correction, unpack and apply our remediation. So what we've done is the traditional CLI for the conversion utilities between 40 and 50%, depending on who you talk to. But what we've done is we've run tens, well, now it's tens of thousands of tests across our application portfolio and our conversion utility. And what we found is there's quite a few different types of errors that we run into, but we were able to classify them into about 17 different types of errors and create targeted automated remediations based on those types of classifications. So you'll see that we start applying our MSIS X fixes right off the bat if we see that it falls into one of those 17 categories. And then ultimately we'll install that package and you'll see it's an MSIX and make sure that it's working or installing correctly. But that's not enough. A lot of these applications will work right off the bat. But then again, the crown jewel being smoke testing, we go through the process of actually installing that MSIX that you saw, and then we smoke test it. And you're able to see, you know, this is not an application that will work when you actually launch it. So now you have the screenshots, you have the data that you need to start making decisions on how to remediate it. This is a file redirection issue. If we do the file redirection, there's a pretty darn good chance that this application is going to work without an issue. And then you go, so, okay. Yeah, all well, your other apps, right? So if that issue resolves around 12 applications across when you actually export it out, you basically go to your app dev manager and say, listen, we fixed this one issue. We can go straight into WVD with, this app, with the 12 apps or 15 apps or whatnot, right? Yeah, exa exactly right. So even if we go back to another one here now, it's funny you bring it up. It's almost like you've seen it before, John. I'll, let me pick up CD Burner XP. Bang, we have another issue. Bang, if you take a look, you're gonna run into a situation as you go through the screenshots where it is another file redirection. So to John's point, if you start seeing real kind of trends happening across your application portfolio, you can make that fix in the environment and ensure that you're uh, you're remediating not just one but multiple applications at the same time so again for us it's that entire journey can i deploy it into wvd as it is is it going to be multi-session friendly can i convert it is it msix ready if it is can you convert it and then after you convert it can you test it because ultimately what i want to leave here with is i want to leave here with fully functional msis where I could just check them, download them, and off I go. Obviously, resign them for my environment. But ultimately, you do have deployment ready, deployment quality applications that are MSIX packages that you can move to ultimately app attach or to uh, manage via into. So, with that, I'm going to take a quick pause here. Um, kind of show the application journey. Again, we're all about providing the data between Lakeside and understanding how that application and user experience kind of play into your existing environment versus us taking that data and saying, let me prioritize which applications are best candidates to roll out first so that you can have a successful proof of concept. So you can try WVD in earnest and then ultimately create a plan that's going to take you from not just deploying your apps and users, but also starting to optimize them, taking advantage of multi-session, taking advantage of uh, a great health score for your users and digital experience. So with that, um, you know, I know we went through a lot of data here today and I wanted to kind of just uh, open this back up now that we've gone through the deck. Um, really quickly, as far as a giveaway goes, uh, our marketing department is going to be offering 
a uh, two free proof of concepts uh, for 10 applications each to assess your applications for uh, for WVD readiness. So um, leveraging the Remo 3 cloud technology, uh, we're going to allow you to send 10 of your apps through to us. We'll walk you, white glove you through what the experience looks like and ultimately give you a report uh, around how your applications look, whether they're uh, MSIX ready, whether they're multi-session ready, and ultimately whether they're WVD ready.